Welcome to this recording of June 2022's NASGP Monthly Lunchtime Webinar, where we are joined by Dr. Tony Downs for a talk on the management of actinic keratosis. As well as hosting as live events, we also publish these as a YouTube video and a podcast, and include a link to the slides in each episode's show notes. Look out for your Monday morning emails from us with details about the next talk, which in July will be on bowel cancer. Thanks for listening or watching, and hope you enjoy the talk. So yeah, we've just welcome to the talk. We've just turned over to 1 p.m. So my name's Ellie. I'm the comms director at uh, NASGP, and um, we've uh, we've been joined today by Dr. Tony Downs, um, who will introduce himself, I hope, at the beginning of his talk. Um, and we've also got uh, Dr. Richard Fieldhouse chairing. Uh, Dr. Fieldhouse is a GP locum, but he more sort of pertinently he's also the founder and chair of the national association of sessional gps um and we're hosting today so dr downs if you're ready it'd be really nice to hand over it's a good thank, time. You. thank you very much for asking me to talk uh, my name is tony downs i'm a consultant dermatologist in sunny devon and uh, hopefully after this talk uh, you'll have everything you need to know about actinic keratoses uh, these are my disclosures. So actinic keratosis is one of the commonest uh, reasons that uh, we get referrals in secondary care from uh, uh, primary care. Um, it's very common. Um, the, it's commoner in men uh, compared to women, and uh, it's commoner the, 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 the whiter skin you are, so skin types one, skin types two, uh, will have more, uh, more AKs than uh, those with uh, darker skin types. Uh, it's commoner um, in an older age group, and it's uh, and it becomes more prevalent in an old, older age group. So, in populations that already have a large elderly population, uh, then you will see a higher incidence and prevalence of actinic keratosis. And it's commoner where the sun shines. So, uh, people who who live um, in uh, uh, parts of the world like uh, Devon and Cornwall, uh, where I'm based. Uh, um, uh, will have a substantially higher proportion of actinic keratosis compared to other parts of the UK. So it's estimated in the southwest of England, uh, four times national average for actinic keratosis and and, uh, and skin cancers. Hi, Dr. Down. Sorry to interrupt, but um, if if you, I uh, just wanted to let you know that the slides aren't moving on. So um, yeah, if you, um, are if they you moving on to... now? Uh, if no, if you skip through those in your window, we should be able to see the point that you're on. Hang on. Fab. Okay, we've got them now. Okay, fine. So, so there, there, there we are. I was just on that. I was on the, only on the first slide anyway. So, um, actinic keratosis. Um, so, why why do they happen? So, ultimately, it's ultraviolet light that damages uh, the dermal uh, DNA, and over time, that can present as actinic damage on the skin. It is a precancerous condition with a low risk of transforming into squamous cell carcinomas. And as already stated, commoner the older you get, but also um, in uh, immunocompromised groups as well. And if you want to know the nitty gritty of how actinic keratosis manipulates the DNA, uh, then there are lots of people who are working quite hard to try and work all of that out. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you might want to just stick on the top bit that says UV radiation and the bottom which bit which says ker keratinocytes. Um, and uh, and uh, a lot of work is looking at trying to unravel why this is happening and how it happens, because obviously that leads to uh, potential new treatments uh, for this condition. So why treat actinic keratosis in the first place? Well, the, the goal and the aim is not only to reduce the number of actinic keratosis an in individual has, but also to prevent future, uh, future skin cancers. Um, the various treatments do provide good short-term e efficacies, efficacies and a cancer reduction. However, there is no evidence that any of the topical treatments we use actually reduce future skin cancers in the long term. All the various treatments for actinic keratosis um, there's, uh, are not 100% effective and there will be a relapse rate, which is on average about 50% over 12 months. The best treatment option is cryotherapy, which isn't uh, available uh, as it used to be in, in primary care. And uh, there's a there's a there's more research, um, but my, um, how, but the reason for treating actinic keratosis is that we know uh, that actinic keratosis do progress on to become squamous cell carcinoma, and the thicker and the more um, the more advanced the actinic keratosis, the more likely that is to happen. 
There are also individuals who are at high risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma from actinic keratosis, uh, and certainly these patients uh, do need to be treated um, and looked after more closely than people with milder uh, disease. There's increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma transformation from actinic keratosis from the ears, scalp, and the lips, also in patients who are on azathioprine and cyclosporine. Azathioprine and cyclosporine used to be stock medications to, to, for, immuno, for, for, for transplant patients, but they, those medications have been superseded by mycophenolate and tacrolimus, which are less likely to induce skin cancer. I mean, but, but, that doesn't, uh, but that still means that there is still a large cohort uh, of individuals who used to be on the azathioprine and cyclosporine who have had their DNA uh, partially damaged um, and in combination with ultraviolet light um, increase their risk of developing AKs as well as squamous cell carcinomas. The more actinic keratosis you have, the more likely you are to develop a squamous cell carcinoma. The more likely uh, you've had uh, you've you've had years and years of chronic sun exposure, the more likely you are to develop squamous cell carcinoma. So what do they look like? Well, some patients have no symptoms at all, but others may complain of soreness, itching, peeling, roughness bleeding and the fact that they don't look nice. It's difficult to apply makeup uh, on top of the actinic keratosis to uh, disguise them. They bleed, they stain clothes, might leave blood drops on your pillow. And patients who have these worry that they might develop into skin cancer. Um, they, some patients understand that they have this weird designation of being precancerous and that in itself can be concerning and, and worrying. There are two, essentially two types of actinic keratosis. There's the flat, non-keratotic ones. And you can see a, a photograph on, the, on this cheek where the, where the lesion is quite flat. There's a little bit of scale on the surface, but most of the lesion is quite flat. And sometimes there is no scale. There's just a, a slight pinkness or a roughness. If you were to rub your finger across the surface of that actinic keratosis, it would feel like sandpaper compared to the normal skin. Then the, the other main type of actinic keratosis are the hyperkeratotic one, where the scale builds up and up and up. And you can see that more clearly on the ear. So this is a, another ear with hyperkeratotic actinic keratosis. Now it's felt that the more advanced types of actinic keratosis are usually the hyperkeratotic actinic keratosis. So these are the ones that you want, want to really treat. You can ignore, you could, if you wanted to, just ignore the mild versions and just say, well, that's just, just normal and just part of, uh, of, of having had a, a lifetime of sun exposure. The likelihood of those progressing into anything harmful is, is, is pretty remote. But these thicker lesions are more likely and particularly in high risk areas like the ear, scalp and lips. Um, so actinic keratosis, they progress and progress to become full thickness epidermal dysplasia. And the other name for that is squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Um, the actinic keratosis are commoner on the sun exposed sites. So you're looking at your front of your chest, neck, um, scalp where you've lost your hair, face, back of the hands. And the lesions can be solitary or more diffuse. So if you, if you look closely at this photograph, there's an obvious single solitary lesion um, in the center of the back of this hand. But if you look at the skin around um, that area, the whole of the back of the hand is clearly not normal. There's diffuse, more subtle damage, uh, more di diffuse, more subtle actinic keratosis. And this has a has a rather scary name of field cancerization, which is which was coined by the Americans and. Again, not a, not a desperately helpful term, uh, but it's the one which is used to describe that diffuse actinic care, that diffuse damage throughout the whole of the skin. Skin that has potential, potential for developing more obvious actinic keratosis, potential for developing squamous cell carcinomas. Lesions can be uh, single or multiple um, and, and diffuse. So this, this patient has lots of multiple discrete lesions over the face. And you can imagine how these, that multiple lesions like this would upset an individual like this, who may find that they bleed, difficult to apply makeup, difficult, uh, difficult to cope with uh, the, the soreness and the itching that, that they cause. This is a variant of actinic keratosis called a cutaneous horn. 
and which is a descriptive name to describe the elevation over the skin. It's hard keratotic uh, lesion. This is an actinic keratosis variant called actinic colitis. Um, so sun damage, usually chronic sun damage, usually on the lower lip, commoner in men and commoner in women who do not wear lipstick, lipstick because lipstick is a great sunblock. Um, so there are two photos, one with a slightly mild area of actinic keratosis, which, would, which is only just slightly red um, and uh, not elevated, it is flat. And again, if you'd run your finger over it, it would feel like rough sandpaper. And, and, a, and a more advanced actinic keratosis, which in which is, is still likely to be actinic keratosis, but the one of the, the concern for that one is has it progressed on to, to squamous cell carcinoma? So these two types of lesions would require a different approach. The very mild one that could be treated with a topical agent, whereas the, the more advanced one, you really want to take a biopsy from that because this one's verging on the way to, to developing squamous cell carcinoma. It might, it might require a surgical excision. Beware the elevated lesion. So actinic keratosis um, uh, can have scale um, and that scale will be flush with the, with the, with the surface of the skin. This lesion has the, the typical actinic keratosis scale, but it's sitting on top of a pink fleshy body and it will be tender on palpation. If you were to press that lesion, the, pa the patient will say, yes, that hurts. This is a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma uh, and requires excision. So for contrast, there's the flat actinic keratosis on the back of the hand we saw earlier, and the scale is flush with the surface of the skin um, compared to the squamous cell carcinoma, which is sitting on that pink, juicy mound of flesh and uh, topped by the, by the keratosis. Um, dermatologists uh, use uh, have the uh, dermatoscopes uh, strapped to themselves like uh, chest physicians have for stethoscopes. Uh, they, they aid a diagnosis. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, I'd be lost without using one, and they're great for help, helping confirm diagnoses. They're, they're great for helping decide whether an actinic keratosis is just an actinic keratosis or, or a squamous cell carcinoma. And here's some examples of what actinic keratosis look like under the dermatoscope. So this is an early lesion, a mild um, area of actinic damage or actinic keratosis with something called a pseudo -red, ne pseudo red network. It looks like the surface of a strawberry. This is a more severe actinic keratosis with the scale building up in the center. You've lost that um, uh, rosette, strawberry looking appearance and the vessels are changing rather than there being a diffuse reticular red network, you can see the individual vessels and they're lining up as linear vessels radially. In early squamous cell carcinomas, you get a combination of blood vessels. So those radial vessels are still present, but now there are looped vessels, also known as hairpin vessels. And that's quite a diagnostic uh, clue to this being a squamous cell carcinoma, not just an actinic keratosis. And there are other clues that you see um, are on, on dermoscopy uh, when viewing acti uh, when viewing squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, these white circles uh, are, 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 are a strong indicator of a, of, a, of a lesion being either a well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma or a keratoacanthoma. Advanced squamous cell carcinomas rarely require um, additional skills such as dermoscopy. Uh, they're usually fairly evident. Um, um, on, on visual inspection. They're scaly, they're painful, and they're often ulcerated. And as in this photograph, you can see that the skin around that squamous cell carcinoma is not normal. These lesions develop on, sun dam on a sun damaged background. Squamous cell carcinomas can, be, can grow fast, they can grow slow, and they have the potential of being metastatic, especially from the ears, lips, and scalp. So here's two, square, two, two examples of squamous cell carcinoma, both on the ear. We've got the well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma with an obvious large, um, uh, a circular uh, elevated uh, lump with a, with a little bit of bleeding and necrosis in the center. And then the other, a more diffuse area of squamous cell carcinoma, which is collapsed in the center and ulcerated. Tumors have to grow their own blood supply or find the blood supply. Uh, so uh, the, uh, a slow growing uh, tumor like a, so, a slow growing well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma has time to produce blood vessels uh, and uh, 
will, will remain very fleshy with very little necrosis, maybe a little bit in the center. Uh, whilst a rapidly growing squamous cell carcinoma is trying to get its nutrients and oxygen from wherever it can and from the surrounding tissue, there isn't time to grow its blood vessels because it's growing quickly. And so the whole, whole center tends to collapse and become ulcerated and necrotic. There's a couple of more squamous cell carcinomas. Um, this is a, an example of a large ulcerated squamous cell carcinoma. And I say the, this could take uh, years to develop or it could, could, could be rapidly over two or three months. The squamous cell carcinoma on the lip. The ones on the lip, scalp and ears are more likely to be metastatic um, and they're the ones that uh, uh, are, are most concerning. So uh, as mentioned before, beware the elevated lesion. Uh, where you've got a lesion sitting on a fleshy, if we've got the keratin and sitting on a fleshy pink mound, that's more likely to be squamous cell carcinoma. If it's a flat lesion, more likely to just be an actinic keratosis. K2A canthomas are a variant of squamous cell carcinoma, a benign self-resolving variant, uh, but they tend to be two week wait, too fast tracked to, for, for, for excision. Uh, they tend to be operated on rapidly uh, because clinically and histologically, it's very difficult to tell the difference between k 2 acanthoma and squamous cell carcinoma. So they're all lumped in together and treated as squamous cell carcinoma, even though they're a benign self-resolving lesion. So when to refer if you're worried about squamous cell carcinoma? If the lesion is tender, ulcerated, bleeding, growing rapidly, or just plain juicy. I think those are good clues as to whether that the lesion is squamous cell carcinoma. Always two week wait them, including lesions which you think may be keratoid canthomas. The low risk site for metastatic spread are the legs and the arms. So they're less of a, less of a medical concern for the, for the patient, but the high risk uh, ones which are more likely to metastasize, lips, scalp, ears, neck, or if it's large and ulcerated. Bowen's disease is a, se is a separate entity. So there is a progression from actinic keratosis to squamous cell carcinoma, and that's one pathway. And another, and another separate pathway is the, is the develop of, development of Bowen's disease, also related to chronic ultraviolet light exposure and, um, and also a squamous cell carcinoma in situ. But these don't develop from actinic keratosis. These just develop from a, just developed as they are in situ, so to speak. They're common, much commoner on the lower legs, uh, legs. You can see them on the neck, ears, hands and scalp as well. And there's a very low risk of squamous cell uh, carcinoma transformation. Um, they, there's a variety of treatments. You can curette them, cut them out, um, treat them with imiquimod or photodynamic therapy. Uh, photodynamic therapy, PDT, is a good treatment uh, on, uh, for lesions like this on the lower legs particularly in patients that might be vulnerable to long-term recovery or ulceration, those that already have a tendency or, or a predisposition for venous leg ulcers, those with ischemic legs, those with a lymphedema. You know, if, you can, if you're going to heal poorly on the lower leg, uh, then using PDT as an option to treat Bowen's disease um, is, is a good one. The ones that tend to progress um, to squamous cell carcinomas are more likely to be from uh, from, from Bowen's disease that's located uh, behind the ear, the neck and genitals. And these ideally are cut out and excised uh, and shouldn't be treated uh, top, with topical preparations. There are a number of options to treat actinic keratosis um, uh, and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll go through the, the, the list of these. Of, in, of, of note, um, inginal mebutate gel was uh, withdrawn um, 18 months ago and um uh, ointment or terbanabulin ointment uh, um, is, is a relatively uh, new one so some advice works um the higher the factor the more likely you are to uh, get, get uh, protection from new actinic keratoses and see a, a reduction in, in your in invisible lesions um, over over time uh, the darker your skin type the better you respond to some protection so uh, patients who are skin type two and three do better with some protection and some block um, against developing future actinic keratosis. And the younger you are when you start using some block, uh, the more beneficial it is and the less like the less future actinic keratosis you're going to get. Um, uh, so to run through the various topical treatments, there's a uh, 3% diclofenac gel, um, uh, effudix cream, um, uh, there's uh, uh, 
photodynamic therapy, there's imicromod, and there's clisari. So uh, five uh, FU cream, FU dips cream, uh, probably the gold standard treatment. Um, for the best results, use it twice a day for three weeks. There are other protocols. Um, some people use it daily for six weeks. Other, other people use it intermittent, more intermittently for, for longer periods of time. But the best clinical rates of success of clearance is twice a day for three weeks. Um, the FUDIX can be used on hyperkeratotic or non-hyperkeratotic lesions. Um, it causes a marked inflammatory reaction. Um, which um, is often worse in the summer because it's a photosensitizer. So it's be it's a better treatment to use in the winter than in the summer. Um, you will get recurrences um, and expect around about 50% over a 12-month period. Um, but um, patients don't like it because of the marked inflammatory reaction. You can co-prescribe topical steroids to try and dampen down that, that reaction. Personally, I don't think that works. So this is uh, 5-FU being used on a, on a, on a large area. Uh, best used on a small area um, and used in the summer uh, and hence the, the more aggressive uh, photosensitive reaction. Um, another product you could use is 2.5% in micromod cream, a slightly more complicated protocol, use it for two weeks, then off for two weeks, then back on again for two weeks. You can treat a maximum area of 50 centimeters squared. You will get a florid in inflammation. So micromod works by, it has a chemical that, that, which tags the, the damaged or abnormal cells and makes that uh, visible to the immune system. So the inflammation is caused by the immune system piling and causing that reaction. And you've no way of knowing how enthusiastic that immune res response is going to be. Hence the wide variety of types of, of, of inflammation that you get with this particular product. The, the clinical evidence shows the efficacy rates aren't particularly high and the recurrence rates are quite, uh, are, are quite high as well over a 12, 12 month period. It's, re it's a relatively expensive medication, um, so and given its low efficacy, not one I would immediately choose. Because that in inflammation can go in quite deep, you can occasionally leave patients with scars or areas of hyperpigmented skin. 5% of micromod is licensed for use in um, actinic keratosis, but it's better used for superficial basal cell carcinomas and Bowen's disease. It causes a re really aggressive fluorid reaction um, and it's just over the top, really, for actinic keratosis. It, it, it will work, but um, your, 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 my advice is to, is, to, is to use it more discerningly on other lesions such as Bowen's disease or, base, or superficial BCCs. There's an example of an imicomod cream reaction, really, really quite, quite aggressive. Um, the um, 3% uh, diclofenac gel can be used twice a day between 60 and 90 days. So that requires commitment from the patient to, to be using for, for such a long period of time. The, effic the clinical trial data show the efficacy rates are, are good for this product, but in the real world ev evidence shows that, um, that it's not so good. And that is probably because patients rarely complete uh, the 60 or even 90 day uh, treatment cycle. Uh, that's re that it's required. You can't use it in uh, patients who are allergic to aspirin or um, uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, and for the same reason, you can't uh, uh, use it uh, in patients uh, with uh, uh, gastritis or poor renal function because um, it's, uh, it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Um, it can cause photosensitive reactions, so, and you may have noticed, seen that in, or observed that in some of your patients. So again, if you're going to use it, I would use it in the winter rather than in the summer months. Um, it can cause um, a, um, uh, allergic contact dermatitis as well, and, and, case, and there are cases of that happening. But by and large, it, caused, it causes very little irritancy, so it's popular with patients because of, the, of that reason. Uh, PDT, photodynamic therapy, um, the conventional treatment is to use that in the um, uh, in a hospital setting using a diode lamp to activate the, uh, the chemical. Uh, but um, there's been a move to try and push it into the community using daylight PDT, uh, where you put the cream on and um, that, that, um, that requires the patients to sit out uh, somewhere relatively sunny uh, for, 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 two day, for, for two hours uh, outdoor um, the exposure to activate the um, the chemical. So sunny or cloudy conditions in the UK are, are reasonable. Um, and you can treat large areas uh, and with daylight PDT it doesn't hurt compared to conventional PDT. 
So, uh, and you get good efficacy and good clearance rates, but mainly for mild to moderate actinic keratosis rather than the more severe ones. Uh, there's, a, there's a little bottle called Acticarol solution, 10% uh, salicylic acid, 0.5% 5-FU solution. That's uh, a useful one to use on, on focal actinic keratosis, just small areas of um, hyperkeratotic or non-hyperkeratotic lesions. Um, it's a good substitute for cryotherapy if you don't have that available in your in your practice. Um, and uh, but it takes time to use um, eight to twelve weeks of application. It can cause a bit of peeling, inflammation, irritation, and because it contains five FU, it can cause photosensitive reactions. So again, you might want to consider using it just during the winter months. Good clearance rates, though, which are maintained. So when it does work, it, it, it it's probably curative for these lesions. A Clisari ointment, so this is the new one uh, that's been released uh, earlier this year. It has a license to treat flat, non-hyperkeratotic actinic keratosis of the face and scalp, um, so-called um, Olsen grade one, so that's milder lesions. Um, so mild to moderate lesions, not severe lesions, not, not scaly lesions. Uh, you can't use it on the lips for actinic colitis, and it's just a, it's a short treatment course, just five days. It causes mild irritation and redness, and uh, you get relatively decent uh, uh, complete and partial clearance rates. I would say somewhere between uh, diclofenac gel and uh, Effidix cream. Um, it, uh, the face responds better than the scalp. But uh, like all these products, there is partial recurrence um, over a 12 month period. So, these are some uh, so this is a patient uh, uh, with the types of actinic keratosis that you, that you may wish to treat uh, with Clisiri. And that's uh, three days after treatment. And you can see the reaction is quite mild. And that's five days after treatment. Um, and that's 21 days after treatment where it's recovering. So, so the reactions are mild. Um, and so it, 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 it might be something to consider in patients who have um, had bad experiences with other topical products but because of irritation and inflammation. Um, and, and also those that um, might not be able to cope well with uh, irritation and, and inflammation, and it does work. Uh, access to liquid nitrogen is, uh, is more restricted in primary care compared to secondary care, although I, uh, there does seem to be a rise in popularity of the gas cryo guns, um, uh, which use the uh, refrigerant uh, to, to, to cool the, 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 the tip of the probe and, and, and allow a... a, a a sub-zero frosting of the skin. Um, and I think they're becoming more popular in the community and in, and in uh, uh, primary care. Um, so they're good for treating, uh, as is liquid nitrogen, focal actinic keratosis and Bowen's disease. Very effective, but, but your patient will experience blistering and swelling. And it's, if you overtreat the patient, then you can be left with um, hyperpigmentation. So this is the kind of thing you'd expect um, following uh, the use of cryotherapy. Um, and what you don't want to see is something like this, where the cryotherapy has been has been used for too long, uh, and has caused a permanent hypopigmentation hyper mark. My advice is, if you've got cry cryotherapy in your service, either the liquid nitrogen or the um, or, or, or the guns, um, the, the, the cryo cooling guns, is make sure that you've uh, had adequate training and you've got a certificate to, to prove that, because because in the you know there are cases where GP where patients do complain um, about um, about the cryo guns. Uh, uh, leaving marks like this, and uh, and, and you, know, you you need the evidence to, to to back up your service to to show you that you've been adequately trained uh, to use these devices. Thicker, juicier actinic keratosis, where you're worried that there might be a progression to squamous cell carcinomas, um, will require histology, and curetting cautery is a good way of, of of getting that histology and removing the lesion at the same time. But obviously, going to leave a small scar as a result of that. Treatment adherence, I think, is important with, with uh, a lot of these types of medications, particularly the topical ones. Um, the, the longer the course of treatment, any medical treatment, uh, the more likely the patient is to stop using that treatment. Um, if, uh, if, uh, if a treatment is causing uh, adverse side effects, the patient is less likely to continue with that treatment. Um, so, uh, so, so, some of the, so, so some of these topical treatments um, um, run, run into those kind of complications. So some of the treatments that we, we have available to use go on for weeks and weeks and weeks. 
there's a risk of the patient just simply giving up on the treatment. Uh, some of the some of the products that, that we use cause a, a great deal of inflammation, and there's a risk of the patient either not wanting to go back to reuse that treatment ever again, um, or just simply abandoning the treatment halfway through the, uh, the, the 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 process. So the ideal treatment would be one which works works well, doesn't take very long to use, and doesn't cause too much of a of an adverse reaction. This table just uh, describes all the options that are available uh, for you to use and, uh, and prescribe uh, as we are today in 2022. I've also put in a uh, little flow diagram about how best to assess your actinic keratosis. So you evaluate your lesion, you're happy that it's uh, an actinic keratosis. Is this individual a high risk uh, individual? Um, are they immunosuppressed? Um, uh, then, um, then consider referring on to a specialist. Um, if, uh, if, if they're not a high risk individual, uh, then um, uh, and uh, they, you're happy with a diagnosis of actinic keratosis, then decide whether or not you've got single solitary lesions or multiple lesions. If you've got multiple lesions or field change, uh, then the best treatment options are Clisiri, Effudix, 3% uh, diclofenac gel, Imacomod, PDT. If they're single solitary lesions or just a small grouping of lesions, then again, Clisiri is quite good, Effudix, Acticarol, cryotherapy or curatage if they're quite thick and juicy. For all patients, regardless of the type of actinic keratosis, routine sun protection is important. It doesn't matter the brand of sun uh, SPF, um, as long as it's a, a, at least a, a, a factor 30, and, and I tend to advise patients a, a minimum of factor 50. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope that's been of some help. Um, and I've just put a, a few resources uh, where you might want to get further information. Dr. Downs, that was fantastic. You've packed so much into a really short space of time. Thank you very much. We've had absolutely loads of questions rolling in. Would you be up for answering a couple of yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So the first one that came up was um, Dr. Evans asked, um, I think it was around um, when we started talking about prescribing particular gel, um, Dr. Evans asked, is that Picato? Uh, Dr. Evans, if you um, can remember what it was you were... So uh, uh, Ingenol Mebutate is Picato, and um, that's the one that's been withdrawn. Um, I, it never really got off the ground. Um, uh, the sales were poor. Um, it, was, uh, it was branded as a, uh, as a short, sharp treatment. Uh, but uh, a lot of the, the the inflammation was quite quite severe, so that was one problem which hampered its sales generally. But also there were cases of squamous cell carcinoma developing following the use of Picato, uh, which we don't see with the other products, uh, and that was uh, the the reason why it uh, eventually the plug was pulled on it. Fantastic, that's really helpful, uh, Dr. Evans. Have you got any riders to that question? Any follow ups? If you do, you can stick them in the chat or oh, you. No, all good. Okay, cool. Um, so I said we had loads of questions, so I'm going to move on really quickly. Um, Dr. Thorpe has asked, in reality, how risky is the use of diclofenac 3% for patients with GI or renal conditions? Okay, um, in reality, probably not, but uh, um, okay. but it's 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 in the it's in the it's in the information leaflet. Uh, uh, the uh, MRHC decided, or whatever they called MRHC, decided to, to 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 add it in because of uh, of of some case reports. But I, I would suspect, in the reality, in reality, highly unlikely to, to be a to be a problem. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, and yeah, if we raise your question, you've got a follow up. Just stick it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, so, Dr. Donati has a question as well. Um, he asked, is the AK lesion itself likely to transform into a squamous cell carcinoma or is the increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma more general and due to higher lifetime sun exposure? So, uh, well, it's kind of true for, for, for both, both, but AKs do progress onto squamous cell carcinomas. AKs progress onto squamous cell carcinomas so rapidly in some cases that you miss the AK, okay? <laughs> It's a progression. It happens. You, you, it's, um, but sometimes you just don't see it. Um, you can't. It's, it's very difficult. There are, re, there are, there are situations where you can get squamous cell carcinomas that are not related to ultraviolet light damage, 
um, and there might be two to, to other mutagens which have um, which have hit the skin. Some oncogenic HPV viruses as well um, can can cause mutations which lead to squamous cell carcinoma, radiation exposure from X-rays. Um, but um, but UV light causes a a a, a, um, a uh, a dysplastic lesion called actinic keratosis that eventually progresses to squamous cell carcinoma, and that, that's what happens. But but also the, the other part of the question is also correct. If you have someone who's got lots and lots of actinic keratosis, the likelihood is they're, they're, they're a high risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma at some point if they live long enough. Very concise answer, thank you. Um, and we've got another one from Dr. Evans. Um, it's quite an open question. Could we get some more info on the management of solar keratosis slash melasma too, please? And uh, there's a little uh, little mini question afterwards. Does anyone else struggle with read coding between AK and SK on system one? Uh, yeah, solar keratosis and actin keratosis are the same thing. Um, there's, there's no, um, they're just, the same name for the same different names for the same entity. Uh, melasma, um, um, melasma again you know, is different different uh, uh, condition, um, cosmetic condition. Um, there are there are cosmetic treatments that do work for for melasma, um, and a lot of cosmetic treatments that don't work for melasma. Um, I, probably not the best forum to sort of like delve into that little rabbit hole at the moment. I think. <laughs> Can you recommend any resources for on melasma? I think um, what so those resources I put up are good ones. Uh, Dermnet NZ, Dermnet NZ, I think uh, DermnetNZ.org is a is a fantastic resource um, for uh, for dermatology. Um, I share with my patients, um, and they, they they describe things very well and give nice little con concise um, uh, reports. So if you look at melasma on there, you'll find a nice little a concise report on, on on melasma and it's updated routinely and regularly um it's it's a great website that's a really good tip thank you so much um i guess i had a bit of a question for attendees as to whether anybody has learned anything new in the last half an hour that they wanted to highlight you can pop it in the chat or um just shout out You've turned microphones on now, so if anybody wants to, to, to say anything, they can. You might need to unmute yourselves first. Um, we, can, we can come back to that. Alicia says was amazing, have written notes. So Very kind. <laughs> <laughs> and what we'll do is afterwards, obviously, is we'll, we'll um, put this on a video and we can put all those links to the resources in that. So you, you, you will all have access to those afterwards as well, if you haven't written those down. Yeah, we, we can send an email around. Um, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Danz, I don't know if you can see these. Yeah, I can see all that. Yeah, good. people are coming out with loads of really good learning points. Um, Olivia. Hi, yes, I just had a quick question. How frequently can you reuse, um, well, any of the ointments, but I've given 5-FU out and then sort of three months later, they're coming back saying, I've got another one, can I reuse it? So it's is a big it, tube. It's a big 45 it is a big grams. Tube. So yes tube so um so uh, yeah i you know it 5fu is a tiny little chemical that uh, even if putin dropped a, a, a nuclear bomb on it will still be will still be there it's, it's it's unlikely to degrade um but there'll be a sell by date on it but i i know i know from personal experience uh, in my patients that they've used 10 year old tubes and it works so so yeah just you can get them to to to, to reuse it um, but the official line would be to uh, follow the advice on the on the sell by date. <laughs> sure, sure. But I mean, if it's within date, can they reuse it within? Yeah, of course they can. It won't go off. Okay. It's full of it's full of preservatives. It won't go off, and they can use it well beyond the the, the date, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I mean, it's quite a bit of money, really, isn't it? I mean, they're all around about fifty or sixty quid these tubes to the NHS, and uh, um, and it's a big tube. It should be reused. Thank you very much. having a look for a few more questions some really good learning points coming up in the chat um
yeah alternatives to cryotherapy was really interesting to people i think anyone want to drop the name of their favorite sunscreen in the chat someone already has yeah i spotted what somebody's kicked that <laughs> off already uh dr downs anything in particular that sort of that you find i don't know whether you work with trainees but when you're working with other doctors that or clinicians that is a surprise to them or things that patients are surprised by uh, in what way sorry i don't don't understand any kind of uh uh sort of general knowledge that is commonly wrong old wives tells people have got that they bring into surgery um I, so that's my dog barking during that um the um the, i think um i think this the sunscreen thing um people do you know do oh, oh i get a common question which sunscreen should i use my my stock answer is that whatever you like um you if you've got bad if you've got um chronic sun damage and you're you're at risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma you need to be using a sunscreen routinely and regularly people go well, i wear a hat it's not good enough you, use, you need to use an spf 50 daily and you need to find one you like there are so much choices now there are sprays gels creams mousses there's so much to choose from so find one you like and find one you're happy using on a daily routine you wake up in the morning wash your face brush your teeth put your sunscreen on um, and that's uh, and that's the the way to approach it if you've got actin and keratosis otherwise you're going to be back in 10 years me chopping out uh, skin cancer from your face and um, and the use of the sunscreen works uh, the, the clinical evidence is there and the burden of actinic keratosis and squamous cell carcinoma in the united kingdom is enormous uh, it's, it's it's beginning to chew up a lot of resources and a lot of money um, and there's a and rather than like stopping smoking there's a good way of still being out in the sunshine um, um, and enjoying the, the the open air in the daytime but protecting yourself. That's really good advice. And you don't, do you ever get people saying that they won't use products with particular preservatives or zinc in or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. In, in Devon, there's this place called Totnes, um, which <laughs> there, there's all sorts of uh, interesting um, uh, uh, belief systems in that little town. Um, but um, so, yeah, so, <laughs> It, it, it can be it can be difficult preservatives can cause reactions um, most sunscreens are it's hard to get uh, pure um, mineral uh, sunscreens now and pure or pure non-mineral sunscreens so most are a mixture of photochemicals and minerals um, and so and, and the reason for that is because they provide a nice balance um, to, they're good to put on they're easy to put on the skin and they work work and last a long time and they're not noticeable on the skin so a pure mineral one just you look like coco the clown um because it just white it out um so they're not user friendly and they're too thick and pasty um and the, and the pure chemical ones well they're more likely for you to cause a to cause a reaction because of the concentration of chemical in there so the the companies have moved to this mixture uh, which seems to seems to, to be a better balance on the skin so that's that's why they're there. So so uh, yeah, I'm sure you can find a pure mineral or a pure um, pure chemical if you want to, but you're better off going with a balanced one. And there will always be people who will react to to the preservatives in them that are there to stop uh, uh, the bacteria, the antibacterial agents uh, in them. So um, yeah, uh, we, we do see it from time to time, but it's rarely a problem with the with the active sunscreen. It's normally to do with um, uh, with uh, whatever 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 antibacterial agents in there to act as a preservative great do you point anybody towards um do you point people towards any particular brands where they've had uh, reactivity no i think um i think if they if there are problems with reactivity then then we i personally would take it so i would take it seriously and and, and do some uh, uh, patch testing con alleged contact dermatized patch testing great got, well, but I, I know uh, you know you could try that you will try different brands but if you look at the back of a bottle of sunscreen or, or even a, even a bottle of back of a bottle of moisturizer you know they're going to be about 30 different chemicals on there so i think it's very hard for an individual to go well, what should, what else should i use it's much better to know what i'm actually allergic to um and um and then go from there that's great really that's really practical advice thank you yeah any more for any more i wonder if there are more questions 
We really appreciate GPs giving up their lunch time to come and join us. I know it's always a bit of a gamble joining an education event, but um, we've got a really great programme of speakers and, and we love everybody that we work with. Our next session is going to be on um, bowel cancer and we're working with uh, Bowel Cancer UK uh, on a talk um, that will just focus quite generally on um, sort of concerns that would affect patients presenting in primary care. Um, obviously, Deborah James is top of the news agenda, so it's on patients' minds, it's probably on our minds too. Um, yeah, we're getting loads of thank yous in the chat, Dr. Daz, I hope you can see them all. Yeah. Great, and thank you, thank you, so thank you then, um, no, Dr. Sounds and everybody, thanks Ellie for hosting. Thank you everybody for coming along, really appreciate it. Um, thanks for all your support and uh, see everyone next time. Thank you. Yeah. Our next talk is on the 7th of July. So yeah, enjoy this then. Bye-bye. In the email too.